Lads, we're back. We are Still back, guys. here. And as the viewers on YouTube can probably tell, we're on Zoom, which means we have a guest. Lads, a guest. today is an episode all about the Vancouver Canucks, and we will have Canucks beat reporter for The Athletic, Harmon Dial. He's on stage today. We'll talk to him. How excited are you guys for this interview? I am wicked excited. I am excited. A bit nervous, but I'm excited. Oh, very, very nervous. I will tell you that. Very, very nervous. You're going to notice if for some reason Adam had a tie and the shirt button buttoned up at the start of the interview. And now for some reason it's not. So that may tell you this episode might have been recorded anyway. But, you know, we'll be asking him about Judd Brackett. We'll ask him about some UFAs, RFAs, the Calder race, all the hot button topics when it comes to the Canucks. A team that have, um, you know, even with the sports world being a bit quiet, have uh, been really getting uh, their fans going with a lot of stuff. So um, here we go. We'll have a little insert 31 thoughts style. Please welcome to the show, no technical difficulties at all, Harmon Dial. And thank you, Harmon, for being here. Harmon, we can hear you. Yes, we can. Hey. <laughs> Finally got the mic to work. <laughs> Uh, but hey, technical difficulties aside, guys, Alex, Daniel, we have a very special guest today. Uh, Vancouver Collects beat writer from The Athletic, a new standard in sports journalism, <laughs> Harmon Dial. Welcome to the show, Harmon. Thank you for being here. Thank you guys so much for the warm, warm welcome. Of course, of course. Um, Harmon, I believe you're Alex's age. You're like a year younger than me. I'm a 99 kid. And you are already a contributor at the, at the athletic. That's incredible. Yeah, definitely really fortunate to, uh, to be in the spot that I am today. I, uh, I initially started contributing to the athletic last year as, um, a part-time student, uh, as a part-time writer while I was still in, uh, in university. And then, uh, this year I was fortunate enough to, to be able to make the jump to, uh, to full time and, uh, uh, really can't say enough about how uh, how privileged and, and honored I feel to to have this uh, opportunity at uh, at such a young age. That's awesome. Um, we'll definitely talk more a little bit about that later on because it's again um, in an industry like sports media that is it's unfortunately shrinking. Um, the Athletic, of course, beside everything with COVID, um, is really a platform that is growing. So it's great news. I'm sorry, my Rottweiler is parking about. Sorry about that. Um, anyway, we're here to talk about the Canucks because um, despite, you know, sports in general being shut down, the Canucks have actually been making some pretty big headlines. But uh, first off, Alex, you want to talk about the uh, 2014 playoff format and maybe a Canucks-Minnesota matchup. Yeah, I, I was just curious to start what you thought of the 2014 playoff format the, that the NHL announced a couple of weeks ago. Look, it's not perfect. I think you're bringing a lot of teams into the fold, um, like the Rangers, like the Canadiens, that um, would otherwise not be um, realistically making the playoffs. You're giving them um, a shot, and, and you're kind of shafting teams like the Carolina Hurricanes, like the Pittsburgh Penguins, who before their playoff uh, their, their playoff spots were essentially uh, locked, and, and now they're essentially going now, now they're going into a five game. Uh, playing series where their odds obviously dramatically uh, decline, and so it, it, there's all there there are all, there are obvi obvious teams that benefit from this. Uh, there are obvious teams that um, that don't benefit from this. Um, but I think when you consider how um, how unique a situation we're in right now, I mean, we all like to use the word unprecedented to uh, sort of define the, the, the COVID moment that we're going through right now. Um, so, I mean, nothing is going to be perfect. I would have, I think, preferred a, a 20 team format. I think that would have been more fair. Um, it would have done more justice to a lot of the teams that were on the fringes while uh, not impeding on a lot of the clubs that more or less already had their spots secured. Uh, so that's where, where I would have preferred things, but I can also see from the National Hockey League's perspective, trying to engage as many fan bases as possible upon the season's resumption, um, especially when you talk about big market teams uh, like Montreal and New York. So um, it's not perfect, but at the end of the day, there was going to be no perfect solution. And um, I think I speak for most people when I say that um, I just want hockey back in, in whatever format uh, we can get it in. Right. I, I really liked how Gary Bettman put it uh, during his announcement that, you know, no matter what team you cheer for, you're always going to find a problem with it. 
that that's yeah. what I that's what I really like. Um, now the Canucks are facing off against the Minnesota Wild, and and I think the Wild, for me, were one of those teams that yeah I don't really know how much of a chance they had in the playoffs. You know they traded Jason Zucker at at the deadline or just before the deadline. So it looked really like they were selling. So how do you see Vancouver matching up against the uh, the Wild? It's going to be a close competition, and um, it is going to it, it's it, it's going to be a really interesting matchup in the sense that you have teams that are the two clubs are almost polar opposites. You have Vancouver, who's uh, a young young up and coming team, who um, they have elite players at, at every position. Um, they're electric offensively. Uh, they're, they're very um, sloppy defensively. Um, and, and it's a team that's going to live and die, I think, by its power play. And then you have the Minnesota Wild, who they play a much more structured game. Uh, they, they don't have the star talent that Vancouver does, but they have a lot better depth, a really good blue line. Uh, but again, they don't have the, the best help between the pipes between Devin Dubinick and Alex Dalloc. Um and, and again, they don't have any offensive game breakers. So uh, really it is going to be, uh, I think a classic example of, of defense versus offense in, in, in this type of series. Do you think, because, you know, as a Toronto fan, I saw this a whole lot, especially with the up and coming team in that, you know, it, on a lot of nights, you know, the Leafs really relied on Frederick Anderson. Um, do you see the same with if Markstrom's not on his game, um, they're going to have issues? Absolutely. It's, I actually made the comparison on, I think, Toronto Radio uh, a couple months ago where I see a lot of similarities between the Canucks and, and the Leafs from a stylistic perspective. Um, obviously, Toronto has, um, has more talent and is further along in the rebuild process, so they're uh, just naturally at a, at a better stage than, than the Canucks are right now. But uh, again, stylistically, there are a lot of similarities in that. Uh, a very fun and exciting team to watch, lots of offensive talent, but uh, you are going to have a lot of back-and-forth play. Uh, and, and because of that, both clubs are going to be really reliant on their goaltending. Of course, Toronto with Freddie Anderson and uh, the Canucks with Jacob Markstrom. And, and the type of performance that Markstrom gave the Canucks, um, I think if you look at all, a lot of their proprietary analytics that account for the defense in front of him, um, you know, you look at ClearSet Analytics or Sport Logic. Uh, a lot of these models projected Markstrom uh, as a top five goaltender this season, and and really from having watched him, he he put together um, an MVP caliber season, uh, and and he papered over a lot of the team's defensive deficiencies. So uh, absolutely, the Canucks are going to be really reliant uh, on Markstrom in this series. It, it, you know, we've they've been off for about. I don't even know how long it's been. It feels like it's been years, but it's probably been like two and a half months at this point. Is there, was, do you think there's a benefit for them being off the last two and a half months? Yeah, that's something that I've tried to think about over the past, um, past couple of weeks. And uh, I can see pros and cons. I think Vancouver is one of those clubs where they might actually benefit because um, not necessarily from, I, I, obviously the injury front matters. They're going to get Markstrom back who, uh, I imagine he would have been ready for the playoffs if, uh, if it had happened in April, but, uh, just down the regular season stretch, um, obviously he was out and, and Demko was taking over the reins as the starter. So that really helps. Uh, but I, I think also from some of the specific players that they have, you look at Alex Edler, for instance, I know for, for veterans, it's, you know, people are expecting that they're going to have a little bit of trouble getting back up to speed. But in Edler's case, he's an example of a player who, through the first six weeks of the season, he provided legitimate top pair value. But as the season went on, he kind of rode it and, and he kind of lost his legs and um, he got tired over the course of the year with the type of workload that he was carrying. So um, I think this type of layoff could really, really benefit him a ton. And, and, and that, in, in that type of a context, uh, it would be a, a massive boost for Vancouver's defense if Edler's at the top of his game. Um, and then elsewhere, Vancouver's obviously got uh, their young players like Hughes, like Pedersen. Um, I think Besser is one of those players who, who may struggle with, with the layoff, especially given how little he played during the regular season. But overall, I think the Canucks uh, will stand to benefit from the layoff relative to a lot of other clubs. 
Uh, um, I'm not as familiar with Minnesota situation, but um, again, a little bit more of a veteran team that kind of caught fire later on throughout the year that might actually impede their momentum. Uh, so if I'm Vancouver, I I don't mind the the layoff given the given the circumstances involved. Is there any word if Michael Furland will play at all in the playing round? Yeah, uh, it, it sounds as if he is skating, that uh, he is recovering, um, and if things do go well. Uh, over the next several weeks, it is expected that uh, he'd be eligible to play in the series. Now, there are two questions to ask here. One is, is he actually going to be healthy enough to to play, go straight from, from training camp into uh, a play in series? And uh, that's an important question to ask because I believe it was a November or December contest when he first came back uh, from his concussion and uh, he played just a few shifts against the Leafs and, and, and he was out. Um, and then a few months later, uh, we again went through the same process where he was uh, cleared to play, uh, went down to Utica, Utica for a conditioning stint. And again, after a few shifts, uh, was back out of commission. So uh, with concussions, it's, it's always tough to, to know how a player is going to respond upon actually returning to game action and just the speed and physicality of the game. Uh, but also, you know, the second question is whether Furland actually fits in right now because uh, you are taking uh, a definite risk because of the first factor, not to mention that when Furland did uh, start the season with Vancouver, he started on on the Patterson line, didn't really fit there, was moved further down the lineup. And if you look at his October minutes, they were steadily declining. And he just seemed out of sorts kind of finding his way. Uh, His puck touches were very rusty, uh, wasn't very good defensively. There was certainly an adjustment process happening there. Um, And it was tough to see exactly where he was fitting. So um, because of that, and and given the logjam that the Canucks do have, uh, unless the coaching staff is going to be 110% confident that Ferland is ready to go at his peak game, um, there's going to be a risk to inserting him into the lineup period. So uh, for me, uh, I expect that he'll be uh, that he'll be healthy um, and clear to play. Whether he actually does um, get inserted into the lineup, uh, that I'm less confident in. So, if you had to make a prediction right now, who wins the series? Yeah, um, it's going to go right down to the wire um, uh, again. Uh, I think a lot of it is going to depend on uh, on the goaltending that each team receives because Minnesota uh, down the stretch, uh, Salak actually stabilized. And, and because of that, um, when you couple that with Minnesota's strong defensive play, uh, they went on a tear, especially given um, how Kevin Fiala um, emerged as a game breaker. So uh, I think goaltending is going to be a huge part in, part in the series. Um my guess, and it really is just a guess because um, anything can happen in the playoffs, as we right. all know. Um, I lean towards Vancouver in five, but um, the margins are razor thin. Like if if I were to lay a probability on it um, in terms of who wins the series, it'd be like a 55-45 split. Um, like, it, it, like it could really go uh, either way here, and there isn't a huge disparity in, uh, in the teams' as a respective uh, ability level. Okay, Adam. Uh, Harmon, there have been articles with headlines like the biggest free agent this summer is going to be Judd Brackett. We know now that he will not be returning to the Canucks. Um, Maybe a bit of a stupid question, but how big of a loss is this for the Canucks? It's significant. Um, You look back at at the Canucks' Um, scouting process and sort of the results before uh, Jim Benning took over, it was, it was pretty dreadful. The, the team really struggled in, in being able to identify young players at the draft, uh, developing them adequately. And, and it's a big reason why after the 2011 run, the Canucks um, tapered off so quickly is because a lot of their core players aged and because they hadn't replenished the, the, the prospect cupboards, um, they didn't have the, the young talent to step up. And uh, because of that, uh, when, when Benning was hired, one of the, the most important task for him was to reform uh, the group's scouting process and, and to improve on their draft record. And that's exactly what's happened 
um, ever since Judd Brackett has took over as the director of amateur scouting. And it really is uh, fascinating that uh, amidst a golden era of, of Vancouver's drafting that you have um, a divorce between uh, the general manager and the, and the guy running the show on, on the scouting side. Um, and, and by all accounts, Brackett was pivotal um, as far as pushing for Elias Pettersson um, in 2017. Um, he's ever since the Ole Levy pick um, in 2016, uh, in 2017, 2018, 2019, um, from what I hear, he's had a he's had a big hand in the first round selections, and a lot of them have panned out really well. So, um, anytime you remove a a smart, a hardworking um, individual who leads a department, um, anytime he's gone, it's it's obviously going to be a big departure, especially in light of the fact that. Um, this is the one department of Vancouver's sort of group that's that's been wildly successful, and, and mm. um, you never want to see the the guy in charge of that uh, leaving. So definitely a, a signif- significant blow. Uh, you mentioned that he was keen the Elias Patterson selection. Um, what exactly is all this speculation in the pot about how apparently Jim Benning was, if he had his way, apparently that they would have selected Cody Glass. Right. Um, and, and on this one, I've honestly heard conflicting reports. Um, there has been that narrative of um, if Jim Benning had had his way, the, the club would have selected Glass. And uh, there are people um, in the industry that believe that. But um, there's also in, in, in conversations with other people and, and just in terms of the, the due diligence that we've done at The Athletic, there seems to also be a sentiment that that narrative is exaggerated that uh, perhaps it wasn't about um, Benning preferring Glass over Pedersen, but maybe it was just Glass being too low, period, on, on Vancouver's board, and that it necessarily wasn't a Pedersen versus Glass thing um, leading up to the draft. And, um, you know, ultimately, none of us were, 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 were um, involved in, in the process. We weren't sitting in on scouting meetings. So um, unless someone from that group comes out and, and speaks on that, we won't know the 100% truth. Uh, but my belief, regardless of, of how Benning felt, is that uh, Brackett was uh, a big proponent uh, of Pedersen along with uh, a lot of his other scouts. And uh, so whether or not Benning would have taken glass or not, um, I don't think that's – I don't want to say that it's not important, but uh, the, the real takeaway is that Brackett was um, a, a big part of the group's decision to take Pedersen. Mm-hmm. You know, they always say that certain scouts are going to have that. They will, will always have that one pick they're proud of. And I'm sure Judd Brackett will always take that Pedersen pick. Is yeah, I got absolutely. That. Um, well, another thing about so what? What exactly is the issue at the core of this? Is it egos? Is it a power struggle? What is the main reason behind this? This sort of breakup here in the Canucks. It definitely seems to be a, a level of autonomy. Uh, we heard Jim Benning after. Um, after the announcement, talk about um, when they had their negotiations in January. It was a it was a it was a question of uh, bracket wanting um, certain power um, and um, and and in in control over the over the department that uh, Benning wasn't willing to relinquish. And um, from my understanding, a lot of that came down to hiring and firing scouting personnel. Um, it sounds like bracket wanted to. Uh, be the one to control which scouts um, they wanted to bring into the organization, which ones they wanted to potentially let go. Um, and, and from everything we've heard, Benning uh, obviously played a, uh, played a role and, and had a hand in controlling the department's personnel. Um, and that's obviously something that um, they butted heads on uh, going back to the 2019 draft on, on day two. Um, the specifics on, on this are muddy, but um, there have been reports that there was uh, friction on day two, just in the sense that um, Canucks management on uh, on with their second round pick, um, Benning and, and Wisebrod kind of pushed a prospect um, up their board, um, w- which of course was uh, Nils Hoglander, higher than than um, than Bracket was comfortable, and it wasn't necessarily that. Um, Bracket disagreed with having the player that high. It was a it was a matter of principle and philosophy of management tinkering management is tinkering his group's board um the night before and i don't think that's that sat really well 
um, with either party. And so I, I, I think the, the crux of the issue really comes down to autonomy. And um, as we moved forward into this year, uh, we, we really heard about a breakdown of, of, um, of communication, uh, of, of trust between the two sides. Um, and, and that's ultimately why uh, I think there was a split. Mm -hmm. uh, we normally have this weird situation, the most recent one probably being when Bill Guerin left Pittsburgh of you have an executive who is going to leave and is a fair guess they will probably have a job pretty soon in another organization. Uh, but it's still under contract until a certain point in time. Now, of course, the timeline of certain events are a bit up in the air, but do you think Brackett will be involved in the 2020 draft in a capacity? Because it, with the messy sort of divorce going on right now and being, again, head of amateur scouting, uh, it, it seems like it'd be a bit awkward to have him around. No, absolutely. As, as soon as his contract expires on June 30th, um, he's not going to be involved in, in the process. And, and the draft, as we know, uh, is now going to be after the season, perhaps in, in September or October. So um, Brackett isn't going to be involved um, in the team's sort of scouting process leading up, the, up to the draft. And in fact, he can, um, and, and Benning confirmed this, he has the power to to go to any organization and um, and help them in their 2020 scouting um, scouting endeavors. So, um, Brackett's not going to be involved beyond the, the, the next 20 days or so. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then final thing on Brackett, I want to ask, uh, where could you see him going? Seattle has definitely been thrown out there as, you know, a team associated with any sort of, uh, hockey person being a free agent. So where do you think, um, wh where do you think Brackett could go next? Yeah, Seattle makes sense as a natural fit given the. I mean, I mean, they're a startup uh, looking to build from scratch, and um, uh, there isn't much better you can do in terms of acquiring a, a director of amateur scouting than uh, than Brackett, and um, he seems to be the type of uh, person who can really lead uh, well and and help you in the in the construction phase of of filling out the rest of your department. Um, and certainly we've seen with uh, Seattle's philosophy and, and just how much they've invested in analytics uh, that they seem to be um, a progressive group, or at least that's what they're hoping for. And, and Brackett certainly fits along with that vision. He was a part of uh, he was a part of Vancouver's shift in philosophy where um, after the 2016 draft, they, they, they put together a more rigorous process and they started incorporating draft analytics and um, it became, um, they, they essentially revamped and, and tried to modernize um, their scouting. And um, that seems to be the, the, the type of forward looking uh, philosophy that would fit really nicely alongside Seattle. But um, that said, I don't think anything set in stone, perhaps, you know, it, perhaps they, they've had uh, discussions, but um, honestly, it wouldn't surprise me if, um, other teams started um, started um, nipping on the heels of, of Bracket and, and seeing if, if they have an opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. Alex? Uh, just quickly, what, <clears throat> what's next for, for Vancouver in terms of scouting? Now that they lost Judd Brackett, <clears throat> what's, who's, who's going to replace him? That's the question that a lot of people have been asking. Um, and I think there were a couple names that, uh, the, the, that Benning floated and I honestly can't remember them off the top of my head, but, um, certainly I think as the, uh, as the meetings for, um, the, the draft kind of, uh, take place and, and, and they do more research and, and continue collaborating just as you go through that process, um, I'm sure there's going to be more clarity on who's really emerging as a leader among that department, um, so really the next step is going to be naming a, a new director of amateur scouting. And, and for that, um, we're still not quite sure yet, um, perhaps. And, and I'd be a little bit surprised if there was an outside hire to fill the role, uh, but that's still a possibility. Uh, beyond that, um, I don't think too much will change. And, and that's certainly the uh, sentiment that the organization um, is trying to echo that despite bracket leaving, um, there isn't going to be uh, a whole lot of, uh, of changes internally um, in terms of their structure. Okay. Um, just moving on from Judd Brackett and more looking at the UFA. So they have two big, or I consider them big UFAs, one in uh, obviously Mark Sherman, another one in Chris Tanev. What, what do they do? You know, obviously it's not going to be July 1st, but 
in free agency, what, what do they do with those two guys, especially looking forward with RFAs and uh, Patterson Hughes, et cetera? Uh, it's a question that everybody's asking in Vancouver right now. And um, actually when you talk about the pending free agents, um, there's actually a third that's emerged in in Tyler Toffoli, who of course came over from the Kings um, after the deadline. And he was an instant fit um, on Pedersen's line, had six goals and and 10 points in 10 games. So um, there's actually a a massive segment of the fan base um, that prefers him over Tanev and, and would rather prioritize that. So, uh, really, there's a, a, a chain of three players that the Canucks are going to have to try and figure out. Um, and when you look at their salary structure, um, they've got just over $17 million in space. So they're not going to be able to bring everyone back, um, especially when you mention uh, the, the RFAs like Jake Vertanen, uh, like Troy Stetcher, like Adam Gaudet. So I, I think from Vancouver's perspective, number one on the priority list is definitely going to be Jacob Markstrom. Um, goaltending has been the backbone of the team's success. And and given how weak their blue line is um, and the fact that there aren't going to be any immediate fixes there, uh, the the team is going to need top-notch play between the pipes and and Markstrom's giving them exactly that. And um, we know that Thatcher Demko is still a bit of an unknown. He had, um, he he obviously had uh, a little bit of a a stretch there as the, as the starter when, when Markstrom went down with injury and, um, ironically enough, it was such a small sample that it didn't really reveal a whole lot as far as um, Demko's potential future and, and his upside. So um, the Canucks need stability in goal, and so Markstrom is going to be priority number one. Beyond that, uh, obviously between Toffoli and Tanev, it's it's an interesting spot to be in because right defense is obviously Vancouver's greater need, given that uh, Tyler Myers is the only right-handed defenseman uh, locked up beyond the season, but. Tanev does have a lot of uh, red flags in his profile as far as um, someone that you need to be cautious of, of investing a lot of long-term capital in because um, he's, of course, um, uh, I believe he's 30. So he's at that age where players um, are, are sort of moving further and further away from their prime. Um, and, and especially with Tanev, just with the number of injuries that he sustained over the, over the past number of years, his decline could actually, and, and his aging curve could actually be accelerated um, in a negative fashion. Uh, so that's really the worry. And, and even if you compare Tanev to where he was uh, three or four seasons ago, uh, he's he's definitely not anywhere close to being the type of top pairing shutdown defenseman he was um, in his prime. Like personally, I see him as a number four or five right now, which is to say he's still a reliable defensive defenseman. Um, but definitely some question marks as to how he projects uh, long-term moving forward. Um, and then Ty- Tyler Toffoli, again, he would help the Canucks solidify their right wing uh, situation um, as far as their top six long-term. Um, and, and so to me anyway, he would be the higher priority for Vancouver. Um, but you never know, given the UFA circumstance and, and just the fact that there are so many uncertainties and, and just that there is going to be a downward pressure um, on a lot of these UFAs. And, and maybe at the end of the day, a, a player like Tanev is going to have to um, come to grips with, with, uh, with a shorter term extension. And, and perhaps that's, uh, that's a circ- circumstance where the Canucks can feasibly uh, look at retaining him. So to me, they're going to be able to bring two uh, of the three back. Um, and, and really it is going to be watching the market dynamics, um, but definitely Markstrom number one priority. And then you got to make a decision on uh, to Foley and Tanev. Is there any worry with Seattle coming up about signing Markstrom to a long-term or even a short-term deal, right? We're only a year away from Seattle. Absolutely. And, and we've seen that um, with the Vegas expansion where a lot of teams um, that carried multiple um, goaltenders uh, of a high caliber that um, they were in a little bit of a pickle where they had to choose between um, sort of now and now the, the present and the future. Um, Pittsburgh being the most notable example where they protected uh, Matt Murray and, and flipped Mark Andre Fleury to Vegas. And um, Vancouver is going to be in a, in a similar dilemma. And I think in, in having spoken to Jim Benning that, um, he seems to think that that's uh, a bridge the team will, will, will cross when, when they get there. And it kind of makes sense. I mean, um, it, it isn't a whole lot of time that they have, but they still need to gather as much information as they uh, possibly can on Demko. 
because right. he is obviously the the younger player. Um, you see a lot of goalies now in their early 30s, and, and some of them have gone through injury, um, gone through injuries that Markstrom hasn't. But whether you look at Dubnik, um, whether you look at um, Braden Holpe the last couple of years, whether you look at Jonathan Quick, um, Corey Schneider, um, there is this group of 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 goalies in their young thirties that kind of fall off a cliff at that sort of an age that Markstrom is, is going to be entering over the next couple, two to three, two to three years. Um, so there is a level of risk in, in committing to Markstrom. Um, and, and obviously uh, your sort of leverage in, in, in just how far you're going to commit to Markstrom is going to depend um, on your faith in Demko. So um, again, for that, I think you're going to need as, mu- as much uh, of an NHL sample as you can on Demko, who's uh, I, st- I still think he's played less than 60 games or something. So um, definitely played less than 60, maybe even less than 50. Um, so you really don't know what you have in him yet. Um, and, 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 and beyond that, too, I think there are a lot of teams in this type of a, a scenario where they've got multiple good young goalies where if Demko doesn't take a, a huge step forward, the Canucks could could conceivably be in a spot where they can protect Markstrom and, and maybe there are more compelling options for Seattle to take um, as far as goaltenders. I mean, look at the, look at the New York Rangers. They've got three good goalies. You look at Columbus, Corpus Allo, and, and Merzlikens. Um, so there are a lot of clubs, and, and obviously Seattle isn't going to take four or five goalies. Um, and, and in light of that context, I think it makes sense to sort of take your time and, and see how things proceed. But um, I, I think Mark Strom is definitely going to be, I'd be shocked if they didn't make a, a strong run at re-signing him and then kind of just uh, trying to worry about uh, the dilemma between Mark Strom and, and Demko moving forward. Um, I, I think a key part of the negotiations is also going to be, uh, I don't think the Canucks are going to want to give up, uh, give, give up a no-move clause, um, which if you re-sign Mark Strom and, um, and you don't give him a no-move no clause, well, then that gives you the flexibility to choose between other goaltenders. So um, I don't think that the, the club is necessarily trying to, um, trying to worry too much about that right now. Okay. And is there any indication of how long the team is willing to go? Because I, I'd assume Markstrom would like as long as possible. And you saw last year Bobrovsky get eight years, ten ten or seven years, ten million dollars. So I'd assume Markstrom, maybe not that deal, obviously, but a longer term deal. Absolutely, that's what his camp is going to be um, going to be looking for, and and um, obviously it it changes given the unique circumstances that the pandemic has created. But um, in a normal UFA environment um, in, in having spoken to various player agents, um, they said that if they were representing Markstrom, that they'd be um, aiming to try and secure five years of term, which I don't think Vancouver would be comfortable um, giving Markstrom, um, you know, paying him through his, his mid thirties. That's definitely uh, a big gamble to take. Um, I, I think from the team's perspective, um, they'd obviously prefer something along the lines of two or three years, which, again, I'm not sure um, how much that appeals to Markstrom. Certainly not a two-year uh, term. Um, I think that would be um, – I think I think they'd be able to find better on the UFA market. But um, when you do look at what's what's available for goalies, and, and I wrote about this, um, I want to say a month or so ago um, at the Athletic sort of – comparing the um, the supply of UFA goaltenders and looking at um, how you have the likes of Braden Holpe, Corey Crawford, Robin Leonard, obviously Markstrom, uh, but you've also got a uh, number of 1B goalies in Anton Kudobin, uh, Thomas Grice. Um, uh, there, there are a number of other that are kind of, that, uh, kind of escaping me right now, but um, the, the point just being that teams that are looking for goaltending help they do have options in free agency. And when you map out each team's cap situation, um, there, isn't, uh, there aren't a whole lot of teams that have, A, the need for a number one goalie right now um, and the cap space. I think what you see is a lot of teams that fit both criteria are already building. They're a team like Detroit or Ottawa where it doesn't really make sense for them to commit a lot of capital uh, to uh, a player of Markstrom's age. So I think there could be, I think it's certainly a buyer's market and that could work in Vancouver's favor. 
Um, to me, I think uh, Markstrom will, will end up slotting between the three to five year ranges as, as far as term. Um, I tend to skew towards believing that it may be towards the lower end of that range, perhaps three or four years. Um, but it is really going to depend on which side picks up more leverage because an another point to consider is um, if the Canucks uh, are, are on the hook and have to give up a 2021 unprotected first round pick to complete the JT Miller trade, well, then Markstrom's camp is going to have leverage there in terms of obviously the Canucks are, are far worse off without Markstrom and may have to give up a really high pick um, if they obviously don't bring him back and, and struggle. So um, three to five years is, is my guess on term. Could you see the team uh, walking from Markstrom, bringing in one of those 1B type goalies uh, like Hudobin or Grice and letting Demko split the net with them, knowing that they have someone like, like Mikey DiPietro uh, in the AHL? It's a possibility I'm sure they're going to consider, but um, I just think it's unlikely uh, when you consider where the team is at um, in terms of in terms of their rebuilding arc. Um, they obviously started turning the corner this year, and um, I think they view Markstrom as a core piece. Um, and obviously, he was arguably the MVP. Um, and so for, for the team moving forward, certainly the, the pressure is going to be on Benning um, to make the playoffs next year. And then, and then, you know, two years from now, um, that's when people are going to expect uh, the team to take a real big step um, and, and take that, um, and take that leap from not only just being a young up and coming team uh, on the rise, but now uh, the expectations are going to be for them to eventually take that step and, and become a, a legit cup contender. And uh, so really the, 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 the implications for, for Benning, if, if the team doesn't achieve um, short-term success, um, it, they're, they're really, really grave. We're talking about someone who could potentially lose his job. And, and so um, given just how long they've been in the rebuilding process, uh, I, I don't think that they can really afford to, to try and gamble and, and bring in um, a, a player like Kudobin and try splitting the net, even if, even if that is perhaps m maybe the, the more prudent option. Um, I think just what Markstrom gives you um, in the here and now is stability. He gives you, um, he's a known variable. Uh, he gives you certainty. And I think all of those uh, are going to be important things for Vancouver um, in the next couple of years. And that's why I think that he's going to be a very high priority. And, and I, th I personally think that it's going to be unlikely uh, that he walks, especially given uh, that Markstrom wants to stay in Vancouver. It's obviously been a, a desirable um, environment for him. Uh, and my last question, has this year really pushed that rebuilding arc ahead? Like, I think, yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I think it was two years ago that really happened. Or, or well, last season, the 2018-19 campaign when Elias Pettersson came, uh, came out of nowhere and, um, and, and emerged as a franchise number one center right away. And, and you could see the immediate impact that he had and, and how he could single-handedly win games. And I think just um, that flash that we saw, that, that sort of helped push the rebuild further further along than um, than than the timeline that that others maybe may have anticipated, and obviously I think um, this season um, I, I think it's fair to say that they that the Canucks um, exceeded expectations um, largely, and um, and so obviously I, th I think on that front they are moving in in the right direction, but I think the ball started rolling for the timeline to accelerate um, last season, and then when you look at a lot of Vancouver's offseason moves that were made with the idea of stepping on the accelerator, right? You talk about uh, signing Tyler Myers to a long-term uh, deal. You talk about trading uh, a first-round pick for JT Miller, signing Michael Furland. A lot of these are win-now moves. I mean, acquiring uh, Tyler Toffoli uh, at the trade deadline and giving up a second-round pick in Tyler Madden. The team is clearly trying to push the needle forward as quickly as possible. Um, and, and I think that's a result of what they saw uh, last year um, and in conjunction with the fact that uh, the team has gone a long time without seeing playoff hockey. Right. Okay. Daniel. All right. Um, so you, Armin, you mentioned that this is kind of like the core moving forward right now and they have a lot of the young talent they're establishing. So I'm just going to go through, I guess like the next 
few years in terms of RFAs about what is, I guess, the most formative for keeping this core together. So I'll go to 2020 first, and I'd like to know your view on Jake Furtanen, Adam Gaudet, and Troy, Troy Sketcher, and I guess, like, proposed cap hit and what they mean to the team moving forward. Right. Um, as far as the, the RFAs this year, I think uh, a lot of them are going to be um, in a spot where uh, their fate is, is going to be affected by the higher profile UFAs. And, and that holds especially true for Stetcher and Vertanen in particular, where, um, you know, let's say Tanev walks. I mean, my, my view of it right now is I think it's unlikely that Stetcher returns. I think internally that um, they, 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 that they don't view him um, as highly as the type of cap hit he, he could uh, command. I think he'd slot um, my guess of it anyway, based off the fact that he's arbitration eligible. I um, a lot of the, and a lot of the comps that, uh, uh, that he, that, that his resume fits. My guess is that he'd slot somewhere in, in the two to two, two and a half million range. Um, and I think, when you consider how I, I think they view him as a third pair defenseman and given how tight they are to the cap, um, I think they're more likely to let him go. But if Tanev does leave and they find it tough to um, bring in alternative options, then they may view Stetcher as a last resort option uh, to try and, and, and have him as a plug and play option as, uh, as a third pair defenseman who can step up on the second pair in a pinch. Um, I think his situation is, is similar to Ben Hutton's last year where um, you had a higher profile UFA again um, at the time it was Alex Edler um, and, and, and the team waited to see what happened with Edler and, and if they could bring him back and then they made a decision to let Hutton go. So I think Stetcher is going to be in a similar spot um, in that sense. Um, Vertanen is going to be, I, I, I think he's going to be the most interesting for me to follow because with the year that he had, um, again, you look at his comps, um, he could conceivably slot in into the $3 million a year range. And uh, so I, I think his fate is also in part going to be determined uh, by whether the Canucks are able to retain Tyler Toffoli or not. Because if you have Toffoli and Besser, um, well, then you've got your top six spots on the right wing locked up for um, the foreseeable future, not to mention that you've got Vasily Pod Colson, who's also a right winger, uh, up and coming. You've got Cole Lind. Um, and then there's maybe a chance there for the Canucks to look at using Vertanen as a trade chip to either recoup uh, a draft pick after having given up uh, a lot of future assets uh, to acquire the likes of Miller to Foley um, or to, to, to bring in some help on the back end. So um, he's going to be really interesting to follow. Uh, and I think his fate is in part going to be determined by Toffoli. Um, and then, uh, Goddard, I think just because of how cheap he is, um, and given that he's uh 10.2 RFA, which means that he's not arbitration uh, eligible, that, that he's not offer sheet eligible. Um, uh, that essentially means that he has basically no leverage, um, and so he's going to be someone you re-sign for, for quite cheap, probably under $2 million. And, um, and, and given the, the team's lack of center depth and, and the steps that Goddard took this year, um, I think he's someone that they hope can eventually be the team's long-term fixture, fixture as, uh, as a third-line center. So um, he'll definitely be coming back. Okay. Uh, we already mentioned already Thatcher Demko. He's, like, I guess, the prominent 2021 RFA. So I'll move ahead to, I guess, 20. 22 and what we're kind of looking at now is we see 12 million kind of given to the likes of like Louis Erickson, Anton Roussel and Jay Beagle. Um, and that's the same time when Quinn Hughes and Elias Peterson require new extensions. Um, how do you think the Canucks are going to kind of move around the cap with that and kind of keep the core together? Yeah, I think right now they're prioritizing not um, they're prioritizing being, I guess, frivolous. Um, and not making um, and not making any bets that um, that that impede their ability to build a strong supporting cast around Pedersen and Pedersen and Hughes and um, and given that both of those guys um, are going to be our, our RFAs after next year, um, that means that someone like Tanner Pearson, for example, who who is set to become a UFA uh, after the conclusion of next year, they're not going to make a commitment on him. Um, until they have um, until they have some clarity on, on where uh, the likes of um, Pedersen and, and Hughes slot in, and, and obviously they they've got some 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 uh, money in in Brandon Sutter coming off the books uh, next year. Um, 
Edler as well, and, and they'll have to make a decision on him. Uh, Jordy Ben, um, Sven Berchi comes off the books. Um, so there's, there, there's quite a bit uh, of room that opens up. Uh, but definitely, they're going to be in a spot where they're going to have to figure out what they what they can do with some of their uh, more expensive contracts. And um, it's not going to be easy to navigate. Um, I think a lot of these contracts are immovable or are or, or going to be, at the very least, very, very difficult to get rid of, especially when you, when you talk about um, Ericsson um, and Beagles in, in particular. So um, I, I'm not sure that there's a whole lot the team can do aside from just making sure that they don't make any, um, any ill-advised signings this offseason. Um, I guess like a year after that, Brock Besser is, needs a new contract as well. Uh, what do you think his number looks like? Uh, yeah, I think for from Bester's perspective, um, it's it's a little early to be projecting. I I, I know his qualifying offer is uh, uh, is pretty high, and I'm trying to look up exactly what it is right now. I th- I believe it's around seven and a half. Yeah, it's so um, he, just to be able to retain his RFA rights, uh, they'll have to make a qualifying offer of at least seven and a half million. So that kind of gives you a, a floor of of where he'll likely slot in, and and for the the rest of it will be contingent on. Um, how he performs over the next couple of seasons, um, given a both his um, his health and the fact that he's got, suffered through, through some injuries early in his career, um, and, and b just um, just the overall maturation of this group and, and how he fits in as a core piece. Obviously, really important to to the team's success um, this year. Um, uh, I think it's a little early um, to be projecting what uh, what what he might make, especially given that we don't know what the cap is going to look like either. Right. What, was there an, a long-term <clears> – <throat> sorry, was Besser offered a long-term contract? There were discussions. Both uh, both sides did, um, did explore that. But um, ultimately, for whatever reason, they decided on uh, – uh, on a bridge deal, and I think um, it gives them obviously the the benefit of a bridge deal is you get uh, short term flexibility. We're now Besser's uh, clocking in under six million, which um, is a really nice bargain to have. But um, from from Besser's camp's perspective, what that does is yes, he's perhaps sacrificing a little bit in the here and now. But um, if he continues to 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 be a, a consistent offensive producer. Um, well, then he's going to be entering his prime and, and he's going to get another pay raise. And so um, the team's in a spot right now where um, they, they, they essentially are, are taking the benefits that come with a bridge deal now with the possible, um, with the possible risk of, of having to pay him more um, than they would have um, had they signed him uh, on a long-term extension um, this summer. So that obviously the, the team... Um, or internally went through that process and, and figured out what made the most sense. And, and they're obviously betting um, that the bridge would have been, uh, would have been a better decision than the long-term deal. Was there, uh, and, I, and I guess we're just looking back at this point, but was there any thought of, you know, the cap steadily increasing uh, with the new TV deal plus Seattle coming in with, and it's just going to be more revenue coming in uh, that would be spread out amongst the teams. Was there any thought that, hey, we'll give you less money now and we'll be able to give you more money later because there's going to be so much more cap space? I definitely think that's that's the way a, a lot of teams saw it. Um, again, the, the factors that you mentioned, uh, Seattle joining the league and the big T- US TV deal coming up. Um, I know in, in, in talking with a lot of people around the industry that they expected um, a significant cap hike over the next two or three years. And, um, and, and obviously the, everything's up, up in the air right now. I think we're, we're in a spot where my guess is we're probably in a flat cap environment for the next couple of seasons. Um, so that definitely changes the equation. But um, I, I think Vancouver along with, uh, many other clubs definitely went uh, into negotiations with their respective players, believing that uh, the cap is going to increase over time. So um, this obviously changes the contract structure and, and calculations um, for every team around the league as, as they try and project their medium-term future. 
Right. And and from what you've heard or what or just what you think, do you there's do you think the cap could go down? I know that was a that was talked about a lot, especially a a couple months ago, even as soon as the pandemic started, um, knowing that we're gonna be out for a while and now it's kind of gone away. But what do you think about the cap? Look, every possibility is on the table right now, especially we don't know what's going to happen with the the resumed season right? We can talk about hypotheticals all we want, but until the games are actually played, the league isn't going to get that revenue. And that obviously is going to affect uh, how they can manage the, the, the cap ceiling for this coming season. So right now I think everything's on the table. You can't discount any possibility, but um, if we're talking about a potential salary cap reduction, just given how many teams would be um, in in a spot of trouble and given that there's already been a precedent um, after the last lockout, it wouldn't surprise me if, if the NHL offered uh, a compliance buyout to each team if the cap goes down. And, and maybe that's a possibility that they even throw around if the cap is flat. So there are just so many moving parts right now. We don't know what's going to happen with, uh, with certainty, but any team that's banking on a cap – one thing that I can promise you is that there's not going to be a significant cap hike. Um, and, and that obviously is going to make things a lot tougher for teams that are close to the ceiling, which is essentially 20 to 25 NHL clubs right now. And, and that is why there are so many teams that, um, that right now we believe that there's going to be a downward pressure on UFAs and that it's going to be a tough market for free agents to enter come uh, i don't want to say july 1st maybe it's september 1st now right okay daniel all right um sorry before we move on i just we want to know your opinion because we talked about this before the episode so we talked about camel car versus quinn hughes for the calder so who's your choice and uh why, why is that right i think first of all the margin between the two is is razor thin both had phenomenal rookie seasons and i think in any other year um each of them would would win the calder in their own right so uh it's obviously been really exciting to have two um two future leaders emerge at the, at the same time guys that are revolutionizing how defense um defense is played and in and, and what the next generation number one defenseman kind of looks like so uh, there are there are parallels between the two, and I think when you when you stack them up against each other, uh, I, I think obviously the the favor the, the argument in favor of Makar would be that um, he's been more prolific offensively when you consider just obviously the the point per game totals, um, especially just how much he's scored independently. His his shot is a wholly unique weapon, and um, it's allowed him to score more. Uh, than than Hughes and and to me though the way I see it though Hughes has the edge when it comes to his all around play and and the type of impact that he's made uh, on the two way front because a um, ever since Alex Sedler went down with injury I want to say around sometime in November. Hughes has played in a matchup role, going head to head against the opposition's best players, going up against uh, the Connor McDavid's and, and the Nathan McKinnons of the world in a shutdown role. Um, and when you look at his even strength, two way impact, uh, he's had a, a greater impact on tilting the ice in Vancouver's favor at five on five. When you look at um, his uh, his numbers in, in terms of his ability to uh, help the help the club uh, outshoot and and out chance opponents, uh, so really his his impact in, in pushing play up the ice um, and 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 being and, and having a stronger defensive impact has been more pronounced uh, than Makar's. Who let's let, let's let's make no bones. He's been outstanding. He's he's been an outstanding two way player in his own right. But I think Hughes has been uh, further along in that respect. Um, He's logged more. Uh, Hughes does log more minutes. So I think, uh, really, your preference kind of has to come down to the question of: Do you prefer the more dynamic uh, offensive option, who, who provided more flair, uh, was more dominant um, with the puck, or or, or Hughes, where um, he was almost as prolific offensively, uh, but he had the slight edge in terms of how he controlled play at even strength. Um, and so when I sort of weigh the case for each, I tend to lean towards Hughes because I personally view, um, I, I really value Hughes' 
um, as far as uh, how he stepped into a matchup role. I think that is uh, that that's rare for a twenty year old defenseman to be able to uh, not only hold his own but have uh, have an excellent two way. We're, we're talking about someone who's in the ninetieth percentile. Uh, or higher in terms of his relative to team, relative to teammate impact um, on shot attempt differential um, and um, on expected goals. So um, I tend to lean towards um, Hughes there, especially when you consider that Colorado um, is a stronger team, which of course helps um, a car's offensive totals. Um, same thing when we talked about um, Lias Pearson. Uh, in Vancouver, was there, I guess, that expectation Hughes was going to turn out to be the defenseman he is after being taken seventh? Expectations were definitely high um, with the type of campaign that Hughes had uh, at the University of Michigan. He was dynamite uh, throughout, uh, played really well at the World Juniors. And, and right from day one when the Canucks took him, uh, like, for example, a, a lot of draft um, draft analysts had him much higher on their board. I had, num- I had him number three. Um, when I did my 2018 draft board. So uh, there was a, a huge sense of elation that Hughes fell. Um, and it was it was a unanimous pick uh, mm-hmm. at the time. It was universally loved by the fan base. And the hype machine started from day one. And so uh, when, when, when Hughes was, was um, when he drew into the lineup for, I think it was five games at the end of last year, just from his first shift, he was he was outstanding. Uh, you saw um, against King against the Kings in that in that first shift. What essentially happened was he just went down to uh, pick up a puck, uh, retrieve it in his own zone. He had a DDD pass, and as two Kings forecheckers both behind the net sort of converged on him, um, instead of making the simple play, he backhand sauced it over their sticks to Adam Gaudet on on the half wall, and it was just like. Wow, it's your first shift, buddy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like, wow, talk about a statement. And 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 obviously, he he made a couple of he had a f- couple of phenomenal rushes that game. Um, had um, uh, had had an assist that he basically generated completely on his own, kind of wheeling around the net. So uh, he he showed uh, elite upside um, right from his NHL debut. So expectations were high going into this season. But I think what uh, what surprised people was just how mature he was um, in terms of his puck management. We didn't see a whole lot of instances where, you know, often you have uh, the offensive type of defenseman. You expect there to be the odd turnover that leads to a goal against. There weren't a lot of those mistakes made, um, which is which is really impressive to see out of a 20 year old rookie defenseman. Um, and, and so for him to have that maturity and I think he was better defensively than, than people anticipated. Um, he certainly exceeded expectations, which, um, is, is remarkable given how high they were going into this year. Adam. Um, Harmon, you've been so generous with your time here. So, um, just to finish off here, um, we want to talk to you, um, uh, sorry, one second. Sorry, excuse me. Sorry. Um, we just want to talk to you about your relationship and the beautiful um, article you wrote about Jason Botcher last May. Um, and really what it meant to you to have such a, I, is it fair to say, a pillar of support in your career? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it meant so much to me. And uh, for me, um, Con- last year was when my um, w- when when people re- really started to go- become familiar with my work, and it was in huge part because of uh, of Jason Botchford and, and how he featured me um, in his athletics, which um, which which were so significant not only in, in in the market in the Vancouver market, but um, you had people that weren't even Canucks fans that tuned in to read his post game articles because they were they were just that good. Um, and so for him to highlight his, to highlight my work um, in, in front of so many eyeballs that, that meant so much for me. And um, I, I got messages all the time. Um, when I think back uh, where people were saying, wow, they DM me saying, um, I- I'm so glad that, that Botch highlighted, highlighted your work. I wouldn't have, um, read your stuff otherwise. Um, and then he obviously went for bat, uh, went to bat for me, um, at the athletic and, and getting me, uh, in a regular contributing role, 
um, a huge mentor for me, just in terms of helping me brainstorm ideas, um, how to go about things in the media industry, um, and just overall growing my brand. He, he was so uh, helpful in that regard. And, and there's no way that I would have made it to this position um, if it wasn't for his mentorship, um, his guidance, um, and his support. And, and so really, I owe, I owe so much um, of what I've been able to accomplish so far um, to, to all that he did for me. Mm -hmm. The smile on your face says it all about him and your guys' relationship. Um, you know what, honestly, I, I can't imagine how proud he would be of you. Like you said, you were on Toronto, um, Toronto radio earlier. Um, that's the Mecca of, of sport media, really. Um, you know, as you say, full-time contributor with the athletic. Um, and now people like us are, you know, trying to get you on to our show to talk about hockey. Um, so again, thank you so much, Harmony. We really appreciate this. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a pleasure. DC, mon amis. We're back. We're back. Oh, we're back. We are we're back? back? Okay. <laughs> we're still here. We're still here. We're still here, guys. We've been lucky. We have had three guests on the show now, and they've all been fantastic. We started Fantastic. With Gary Gould, fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> Absolutely. He's got to insert him into the episode. Listening. <laughs> <laughs> he might be our next guest. I don't know. Anyway, though, guys, uh, so that was, again, going back, uh, Harmon was such a fantastic guest, uh, generous of his time. What were some of the things you liked most about that interview, lads? Just his knowledge. It's so in-depth. You know, he loves his home team. He knows everyone, like, you know, any level. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what Daniel said. That was what I was going to say. He stole what I was going to say. Mm -hmm. It's just – it's so amazing to see such a young guy. I believe he's your your age, Alex. So you're yeah. gonna be about a thousand years younger than Daniel. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows how old Daniel's. Invention of the wheel. <laughs> anyway, it's, just, it's so impressive to see a guy like you know when when somebody tells me Adam, you know about a lot about hockey. I'm like, no, I don't. Jeff Merrick knows a lot about hockey, and now I can I can say no. Armin Dial knows like. It's, it's incredible at such a young age. You could throw that guy on the radio every day or, or you know, TV or something. I think he'd be great. Like, he For just sure. had such a professionalism about him. Yeah, definitely. Incredible. Um, what do you think? What was your guys' favorite part specifically? What was the part where you're like, damn, I like that stuff? I, I enjoyed talking to him about uh, what their matchup against the Wild is going to be. Because he gave me – it was a different perspective, right? I think when we talked about last episode, it seemed like uh, it was just going to be a clean sweep of the yeah. Vancouver Canucks. And he's like, no, no, it's not going to be like that. He's, it's going to go down to the wire. And I'm like, man, I never would have guessed it would have gone down to the wire. Mm -hmm. What about you, Daniel? Me, um, I think it's just us from being here in the, uh, I guess, what are we considered? East, no, Central, Central Canada in Ontario. Sometimes we're we kind of just, Canada? I believe so. And then like, we're not in the Maritimes. Yeah. Um, what I kind of feel is that sometimes we have that perspective that we look at, yeah, like their star, their star players. Then we're like, oh, what about that Louis Erickson, you know, Chris Tana, Alex Edler situations. Right. But the way he was kind of able to say that, you know, these are the prospects coming in and these are the options that the Canucks are going to have in, at the negotiating table. They could, they're going to work around it and they're going to keep this core. That's what I really liked about our talk with Harmon. For sure. Well, uh, again, if you are watching this episode and you want some more of Harmon's content, because why wouldn't you? The guy's, uh, the guy's brilliant. Um, we'll definitely link uh, to his page on The Athletic. Um, the Athletic, seriously, so much great content. It's not that expensive, so please go check it out, especially his articles. I think he had a recent one about, you know, the Judd Brackett situation, of course. Um, and some uh, JT Miller. JT Miller as well. There's so much fantastic stuff, including all the articles. He uh, he definitely mentioned a few, and we talked about some as well during the interview. Um, please go check them out because, of course, support writers. It's a difficult job, uh, people. It's a difficult job. If you enjoyed this episode of the podcast, uh, stay tuned. We're trying to get more and more guests coming. But if we can't, then I think our next episode is going to be talking about the Lego movie. That's the situation we're in. That's the situation we're hey, Daniel, in. Daniel, air high five, man. Air high five. Then after that, <laughs> before Christmas, maybe some redirect. Real filler stuff. 
figure it out. Hey, we're getting closer to hockey. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, like apparently half a dozen or a bunch of Pittsburgh Penguins are practicing. And so perfect. far, only three Habs are going to have be able to skate tomorrow, which is Oh, perfect. good, good, good. What if there's a third Hab? Byron, um, Gall- no, Byron, Drew, and someone else. I don't know. All right. Um, well, guys, again, if people like this episode of the podcast, first of all, check it out on YouTube for a video experience of the show. See all our beautiful faces. Um, be sure to check out all of Harmon's stuff, Twitter, his athletic page, all that type of stuff. Check out the show's YouTube channel as well as my YouTube channel because, of course, go check out last episode with Mike. Oh, uh, fantastic killer. episode. Uh, again, one we'll see right now. Thanks for coming on, Mike. Fantastic. Love to see you. And we'll try and have you back on soon. Uh, check out the show's Instagram page as well as all of all three of ours um, social medias, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah. Um, just Twitter because I don't use Instagram. Um, and leave a review, five stars, maybe a comment about who should we try and get as a guest on? Yeah. What would you like to see? Yeah. What do you want to see? Um, because exactly. at the end of the day, we're here to pander to you. Exactly. Exactly. Um, guys, anything else to say to the lovely, lovely? Let's see y'all on Sunday. See y'all yes. on Sunday, Daniel. Oh, anything- before we go, you know mm. what's starting soon? Uh, F one. Formula One. So yes. you absolutely know we're going to talk about it. Yes, I gotta. Okay. Yeah, got download those races. Find it somewhere. <laughs> Charles Leclerc, my boy. <laughs> okay. Alex Albon. <laughs> now we're just listening, guys. Okay, see you guys on Sunday. All right, bye.